Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you all for um, facilitating Philip and I um, by changing the time to half an hour. We're both coming from uh, work off site. Well, I'm going to work off site, but obviously Philip is, is based off site. So most of you will know me. I'm Suzanne Gear, and I'm a senior lecturer here in the school. And Dr. Philip Dodd is a long standing colleague of mine. He's been a, an adjunct senior lecturer here in the school. He's now currently adjunct senior lecturer in the School of Medicine. Um, he is the head of psychiatry in St. Michael's House um, and also has roles of responsibility with Trinity and uh, or CSI. Um, and we've been working together for 15 years now. Um, so we're really delighted to be here today to tell you a little bit about, I suppose, what we see as being a strand or a thread that's in our research. Um, that, that act, activates our minds in different ways depending on which project we're looking at. So we're going to try and capture a little bit of what we've been working on um, today. Um, just to start off by saying this is a, a strand of work that we've worked on with many excellent colleagues. Um, as you can see there, there's been a group of lead researchers and supervisors involved going back more than 10 years particularly John McAvoy, who's worked with us for a long time. And then in, in those 10 years, we've had some fantastic support from postgraduate stu uh, post students and researchers and postdoctoral researchers on their name there. So really, the work that we're going to present is a, is a collaboration across those groups. So we're going to try and, 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 and tic-tac on this and, and, and share our, our perspectives. So we may overlap on each other a little bit. But we are really looking at this idea of complicated grief. Recognising that grief and bereavement are part of the normal ebb and flow of life and that most people will experience these emotions and these phenomena in a way that is, while challenging, is perfectly normal and that they will adjust and adapt to those losses over time. But we have grown more and more aware of the experiences of sometimes a small subset of people who experience a different type of grief. And these words here just capture some of the phrases that have been used to try and understand that phenomenon. We put pathological in inverted commas intentionally because there is a, a debate, a discussion about how natural or unnatural, typical or atypical these experiences will be. But they've been talked about as being traumatic, being delayed, being unresolved, being prolonged, persistent. You'll see a lot of the words there talk about complicated grief in terms of its time frame, how long it lasts. But that would be one aspect of it. So what we're going to try and do is give you a little bit of history and um, briefly, a little bit of theory, just for context, and then tell you a little bit about some of our research. Um, part of the context for this, though, is the awareness of complicated grief in the media. And these are just some screenshots of recent stories in, in different online blogs, different news, news um, media, reporting on this issue of a, a complicated grief. And a lot of this was driven by the debates around the inclusion of this, um, this difficulty in DSM-5, which we'll say a little bit about. And always having to have the Daily Mail on hand as one of the, I mean, one of the most frequently communicating research, um, one of the newspapers that most frequently reports research and discusses research issues to the typical population, even they've picked up on the idea of grief as an, as an illness needing to be treated and the, uh, the concern there at the medicalization of life events. But hopefully we've shown that this is an ongoing debate um, in the media, and there is a waves of public awareness around it. But really there is an issue of language here. What are we talking about? Um, we see concepts of death and grief and grieving and bereavement in the literature. And one of the very first papers that Philip and I worked on um, with a student the, the first sort of feedback we got from the reviewers was we'd use the terms grief, grieving, and grieve, and they wanted definitions for them. And we did scratch our heads a little in terms of how we would sort of tease out those concepts. So we are aware that this is a complex conceptual area. So where better to look at than, than theory? And I might hand over to Philip sure. to say a little bit about some of the theoretical uh, underpinnings here. I suppose just to go back to that, the general understood um, definition around grief and bereavement, I, I think it's well understood. So grief is, is the emotional response to a bereavement. So bereavement is an event, a, lo a loss event, obviously, and then grief is your emotional response to that. So there's been a number of conceptualizations or ways of understanding grief 
um, really since the, well, probably, I think the first reference is probably in Shakespeare around King Lear. So King Lear and the whole trauma of his daughters, um, he, he, he feels and reports that, that the grief that he felt crazed his wits. So that would give the sense in that uh, piece of theatre that in fact the grief was so profound that he wondered about his sanity. Uh, Freud had great, um, uh, I suppose, an ambivalent uh, relationship with grief, um, very much associated grief with the development of melancholia and depression, and um, would, in, in the very early part of his, his uh, writings, describe case studies around um, probably a case of complicated grief. More recently then, um, I suppose Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, and uh, Colin Murray Parks would probably be the most prominent uh, exponents of the stage uh, theory of grief. This idea that uh, you experience a significant loss and then you, you have a passage through an understood, um, I suppose, journey where you feel various stages of grief where you then arrive at this destination of resolution. Um, I don't think I've ever met anyone in my own clinical practice who actually presents like that. Um, but it probably was an initial useful model for people in the general population or people in the caring professions to even engage initially with coping with people who are at grief and bereavement. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be at all dismissive of the idea of developing a staged theory of grief, but probably its simplistic nature and the idea that if you don't adhere to the, the, the stages as described, that you're in some way abnormal, that probably isn't particularly effect, um, helpful. Um, I'll just highlight, we've only time to highlight some of these. So the dual process model uh, is a model I'm very much, um, I suppose, affiliated to. This idea that you've really got two things that you can help the grieving individual achieve. A sense of uh, functioning, so a sense of getting on with your life, and also a sense of work on your grief experience. Um, and Anne, who, who's our postgraduate student with us today, Anne and myself have done some training in a particular type of psychotherapy associated with the dual process of, um, of, of, complicated, of understanding grief and managing people and supporting people with complicated grief. Uh, Priggerson, Holly Priggerson is a US-based researcher who uh, in some way has dissected the staged theory of grief and in, in many ways describes a much more meaningful state uh, theory of grief, whereby um, she feels we go through various stages where states of grief are more prominent. Um, we are inclined to underestimate that most people who grieve have a strong sense of acceptance throughout the grieving process, whereas the original stages theory of grief would have, in some ways have suggested that acceptance comes at the very end, For in fact most people describe symptoms of acceptance from the moment that, that it begins. Um, probably the state uh, theory of grief is more akin to some of the resilience models uh, that we um, are familiar with, um, uh, that we can hopefully talk a little bit more about later. Um, we, we've linked with uh, Catherine Sear. Um, Catherine Sear is a very important researcher in the whole area. She's a clinician researcher, so she's actually a psychiatrist who works in the School of Social Work, but she's very influenced by psychological models and psychological treatments. Um, she's just completed a randomized control trial looking at the effectiveness of her CBT-based treatment for complicated grief. More importantly, from my perspective, she very much has enlightened me as a practitioner around the centrality of attachment theory to our understanding of grief and bereavement. So obviously grief and bereavement is associated with detachment and the various behaviors associated with that. I suppose the relevance to ID, so I work with people with intellectual disabilities, whereby attachment theory is a really compelling model to understand um, the behaviours associated with grief and bereavement, because we know that in attachment behaviours we have both explicit memory and implicit memory, and it's really the implicit memories that really, um, I suppose, uh, become prime when you're working with a service user who has experienced a significant loss and who's going through what other people would describe as it couldn't be connected with the loss, so they wouldn't have known that the person had died, and yet they're experiencing uh, detachment-type symptoms, which I feel are based on uh, implicit memories. So we know, as a general run through the uh, literature around uh, complicated grief or prolonged grief, it's an approximate prevalence in the general population of 1 in 10 or 10%. Obviously, there's huge uh, 
health warnings associated with that type of prevalence figure because we're, we're, we're comparing different studies mm -hmm. and there hasn't been a significant meta-analysis looking at this. So it's a very much a rule of thumb type prevalence. Um, the, the, a lot of work has been done to try and develop from a biobehavioral perspective and a biopsychosocial perspective that this is different. Complicated grief or prolonged grief is different to a lot of, a lot of other similar uh, mental health presentations. So it is uh, characteristically different to depression and anxiety. It shows a very poor response to tricyclic antidepressants. Um, it's different, it, the symptoms that um, distinguish uh, complicated grief um, as a distinct clinical entity are different to, to those than would be in post-traumatic stress disorder. And then there's some more recent, um, I suppose, biological uh, studies. So there's this sleep EEG study, but there's also a very recent functional MRI study by um, O'Connor, which we didn't put in the reference, that in a small study of 23 cases has shown, 23 comparison cases, has shown a distinctive uh, functional MRI uh, distribution as well. So this slide actually is just to highlight that there is there are significant differences between complicated grief um, and uh, conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression. Um, we didn't actually explain, we're using the term complicated grief and prolonged grief disorder interchangeably. And that's sort of by design because the sector is unclear as to the actual term that we should be using. And for the last 10 years, there's almost been a preferred term per year, yes. which makes research in this area really irritating in some ways. And we say systematic, systematic review systematic, very hard. Exactly. So the number of papers that gets included in the systematic review is going down slow. And just to say that this <coughs> table is actually from Catherine Shearer's uh, randomized control trial, but it's a really nice capturing of recognizing the similarities that are there between complicated grief and other DSM-4 disorders, but also highlighting its distinct nature as well. And that's, I suppose, a base, a, a real core position for us because it is a, a distinct entity that we're, we're interested in looking at. Um, <coughs> I suppose other uh, research that, that, that we have looked at with is associations or risk factors um, associated with the development of complicated grief. Some of this research goes back quite a while, but probably since the late 80s, more or less the symptoms associated with an understanding of a complicated grief response have been mostly consistent, which we will come to. So this idea, a lot of this research also clusters around poor attachment styles, um, early life, um, uh, early childhood difficulties. Um, so for example, separation anxiety in childhood, a preference for lifestyle regularity, that need for control in, 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 in personalities, and a lack of pre preparation for death. In fact, what actually got me interested in this area of research was as a trainee in psychiatry, I came across a case whereby uh, um, a young um, uh, person got married, husband uh, was thrown off, catastrophically thrown off a horse and uh, was killed and subsequent to the death this uh, this new bride discovered that he had a whole other life uh, that she wasn't aware of and she was traumatized by this and really it was her uh, difficulty uh, getting through what she was being told was should have been a normal grief experience that, that made me more and more interested in in the complications so she, she had a complete lack, lack of preparation in, obviously for the death but also for the subsequent understanding of her relationship with the person that she'd lost that threw her into a very difficult uh, grief response. So this slide just captures some of the, the, the points that we've touched on, which is the debate regarding the criteria for complicated grief. If we use that term um, consistently, we've, we've always used that term because the prolonged grief suggests that it's time dependent and we do feel that it's actually more complicated than that. But these, this is just a selection of papers um, from a, a range of, of publications that have really discussed the criteria. And central to this debate has been a, a long-standing discussion of the inclusion of some aspect of complicated grief in DSM-5. So that was a real driver. So you'll see the, the key people there, Catherine Shear writing in Depression and Anxiety, um, and Holly Priggerson as well discussing uh, criteria. And we do have now a, a representation in DSM-5 that we'll come on to. Um, but with ICD-11 coming out later this year, um, next year there's some there's, there, there is ongoing discussion about what actually makes for a complicated uh, grief experience. So it is with a lack of, of guidance that we've been looking at this area.
Now we want to summarise, I suppose, two particular positions on this idea of complicated grief from you. One that's been really central to our, um, our research and then how DSM-5 has represented it. So you have a, a, a grouping of, of criteria that have been identified as consensus criteria here. And in Prigerson's framework, she divides them into separation distress, those experiences that are in relation to that separation, that separation experience, and then more traumatic distress items. And within this framework, the idea is that these last for at least six months duration, and importantly, there is a social impairment, there is an impact on the person's social functioning. Is that what you want to pick up on that? Um, I suppose these were consensus uh, developed criteria, probably representing the key uh, researchers that had done work in this area be between around 1980 and 1999. Um, and from, from a, they also, from this, developed a number of uh, diagnostic criteria that were applied to children yeah. and obviously then we were trying to take this further uh, to look at it within the, for people with intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one key thing is the whole six months duration, this idea that we don't have time to go into either the debate about whether we should classify illnesses or the debate about pathologizing or not pathologizing a normal life event. We, we, we'd probably be here for the rest of the day if we could mm -hmm. into that. Um, obviously, there's pros and cons on both sides, but, but there's nothing to suggest in the literature that actually somebody who's been experiencing significant difficulties seven months, eight months, nine months after an, an index loss, that they should be left until 12 months, that mm -hmm. there's some benefit in waiting for this putative perfect pathway through grief. They usually do very poorly, and there's nothing in the literature that would suggest that, in fact, uh, um, identifying somebody who's significantly struggling uh, after six months, that that is the time that actually one yeah. should engage them in more enhanced uh, therapeutic inputs. Uh, Pre-six months, it, it's, a, it's a slight matter of debate. The only other thing to highlight is a lot of the controversy associated with DSM-5 in the US and the changes in DSM-5 associated with grief and bereavement was actually not necessarily associated with complicated grief. It was more of removing the warning around diagnosing depression in grief. So there used to be in DSM-4 there was this idea that one shouldn't diagnose an illness of depression, either mild, moderate or severe, unless it was at least two months since the index loss. And that warning was removed in DSM-5. So therefore you had a whole swathe of opinion that would suggest that we were pathologizing grief and that the levels of, of prescribing of antidepressants would suit up. Um, we don't have the time to get into the debates around that, but obviously it's very important. And um, So the DSM-5 criteria were completely not relying on most of the research that had been done in the area. So the development, I don't know if anyone here has been involved ever in the development of diagnostic criteria, but it's it's, it's very much a political process. It involves some reliance on the research literature and the research community, but it also relies a lot on clinicians of varying levels of engagement with research and clinical research. So it also, it, it all, especially DSM, it's often a distillation of a number of different pressures. And in this DSM-5 um, classification around uh, what they call complex bereavement related disorder, which is a completely new term, not at all described in any single paper in advance of the publication of DSM-5, this was produced. And to be fair, it is in the section of areas that require further research and further examination. So it's, it's, you know, I think that's an important caveat. But it is interesting to look at the criteria, both in terms of the Prigerson criteria, <coughs> but also as standalone. You'll see that there's a change from six months to 12 months in terms of the time frame. But what's still there is, as you will have seen on the previous slide, is a weighting towards the more traumatic elements. So one in four elements of separation distress was Prigerson's benchmark, and five of nine and traumatic distress. And we see this weighting carried on in the in the DSM criteria, again, one in four, where there's more days than not that they experience either yearning or sorrow or preoccupation. And then six in six of twelve from the group C criteria, which are a reactive distress or social identity disruption. And we've given us some of the symptoms there. So still a weighting towards the more traumatic reaction to the bereavement. 
still the impairment of function there. And, and an additional point of that these criteria, these experiences are inconsistent with cultural, religious or age appropriate norms. So recognising that there will obviously be variation in, in what is considered typical within a cultural or religious or age appropriate set, setting. So suffice to say there's lots of problems with this. Um, many of the dimensional approach to the, many of the, the symptoms in these dimensions do not characterize or do not distinguish a symptom of, or, or a, a presentation of a, a complex breathing related disorder. And um, so there's a lot of fears in the US that this is actually going to create a whole increased number of people um, where there's a sense of false positivity that they may not necessarily have complex bereavement, but they still will be referred and treated appropriately, and then others may, may be lost. Um, yeah, so that's the end of the really. So the, here ended the, I suppose, theory and context, and what we want to do now is switch to tell you a little bit about we, how we've operationalized some of these issues and debates, and the, 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 the large area where we've worked on, on this topic is in our work on intellectual disability. Um, and we've been involved, are involved in a number of studies that have tried to understand the experience or the reality or the challenge of complicated grief for people who have an intellectual disability. Um, our early work very much looked at staff reporting using Priggerson's framework and some of the tools that she had developed for assessing complicated grief. We were really interested in how staff uh, carers, uh, from key workers within intellectual disability organisations reported on service users' experience, individuals' experiences of the, uh, the, the, the criteria that have been uh, described there. So we did a, a one major study which formed um, a key part of Philip's um, MD thesis which looked at the occurrence of these symptoms within people with an intellectual disability, not from a perspective of diagnosing to any extent, but to really try and capture what were the what were the elements of this phenomenon that really were most pertinent to people with ID. And what was interesting, and, and, and to summarize the work, it, it, you know, again, we would be here all day, we're gonna focus on the work we've been doing with adults with intellectual disability themselves, but what the staff studies really showed was that it was the separation distress items, uh, the, the, the separation, the, the worries around that attachment loss that were really distinguishing between people who were uh, who had experienced a parental bereavement and those who had not. The traumatic distress items were not really distinguishing people who were experiencing difficulty. But we were finding quite high rates of reporting of these symptoms by staff. So we, we, we decided that we would extend this piece of research into um, self-report to actually try and understand what uh, people with ID themselves were in a position to report on because one of the, the findings in this, uh, this research was that staff had difficulty reporting on the internal world of the person with an intellectual disability, not surprisingly, and that some of the criteria, things like reporting hearing the person's voice, or the, the person who died's voice, or reporting seeing them weren't really reported by staff members and we were interested in whether they would be reported um, by individuals themselves. I suppose the other issue just in general you know Christine I'm, I know presented to this group I think in the same forum a number of weeks ago so you know for anyone who wasn't there people with intellectual disability live lives in, in, in Ireland uh, as well as many other western countries where a lot of the key decisions in their life they're not in control of so where they live but at a critical time, often in people, adults with, with intellectual disability, if they lose an index carer, such as a parent, it often sets up a whole series of uh, loss events, so a loss of potential in, um, relative independence living at home, uh, lack of control of where they ultimately live, maybe living in very precarious uh, respite settings. So as a clinician working in, with, with adults with intellectual disabilities, what compels me to do this research is that it, uh, often the loss of a parent for somebody with an intellectual disability heralds a really difficult trajectory around their mental health and their behaviour and the level of restriction around their lives. And unfortunately, our services are set up to be somewhat reactive to people's inevitable parental losses. We're inclined to just hope that they won't lose their parents despite the fact they're living in their 80s and 90s. And we were very poor at preempting it. So part of the value of this research, I would hope, is that we can characterize in a more detailed way that actually the, the loss experiences, the loss life experiences associated with parental loss is in fact associated with a lot of negative outcomes.
and hopefully uh, move forward this idea of being more proactive in supporting people um, around losses. So a key part of, 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 of our recent work has been looking at uh, the experiences of people with ID themselves of um, parental loss and the, their lives after that parental loss and to do that we worked to develop a self-report version of the staff questionnaire that I mentioned on the previous slide and this involved working with uh, colleagues in St Michael's House from speech and language um, also drawing on the expertise of, of, of people like Philip and John McAvoy who are practitioners working with these groups to try and develop a, a structured tool that would allow us to explore quite complex concepts um, in a way that was accessible and appropriate. So we developed the CGQ ID self-report tool um, and this is just a sample of the, the questions. It's done as a structured interview using uh, visual prompts based on a uh, board maker. So this question says some people get very upset when they think about the person that died. Do you get upset when you think about and they're asked about their mum or their dad, whoever the index loss has been. And the visual prompts are used to support that communication. So we establish whether they've experienced this criterion and then we look at the frequency with which it happens and we use visual prompts there. And the questionnaire is really structured around those three broad areas of separation, distress, traumatic grief and social occupational distress. And we're interested in the symptoms that occur frequently, so are reported as occurring a lot or all of the time or often or always. And we're currently collecting data, it feels like we've been collecting data for a long time, um, but as you can imagine, this is, 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 is a, a, an experience that we have to, you know, we have to find participants who are in the right place to engage with those. They've had this experience, we have to do it in a way that's sensitive and that's ethical, so it is, it is something that takes time, but we're, we're working to try and validate the self-report version of, that, of the scale. Um, and what we have just pulled out is a few really simple uh, sets of findings from the ongoing self-report. Um, this is a, a, a very early piece of work that was done by Tom Burke as part of his Master's in Psychological Science thesis, where he was looking at the self-report data in relation to Catherine Shear's criteria, which are very similar to Holly Priggerson's framework rather than the DSM-5, but with some slight differences. So what this shows is that we, we had um, interviewed 10 people and all of them had experienced a parental bereavement in the time frame required. So they all meet the first criteria. The red uh, section is that they had one in four of the separation distress type criteria. The green is that they had two of nine, which is Shears criteria for the more traumatic experiences. And D is that they've been, those difficulties have been um, ongoing for at least a month intensely. And then criterion E is that they're impairing their, form, their, their engagement. So what we saw was that obviously everyone had experienced a bereavement. Four of the ten had experienced those separation distress difficulties. The same four had experienced the more traumatic difficulties. But when we moved into the, the, the time frame, the more than a month and the impairment in their social functioning, really there were two individuals who met all of these criteria. Um, so what Tom found was that there was you know, two in 10 of the sample that he looked at met Catherine Shear's criteria for a complicated grief. And we're not identifying that from a diagnostic perspective, but it's useful in terms of identifying, first of all, the majority of people who experience a, a, a parental bereavement were doing well, were not experiencing those symptoms but there was a subgroup who were experiencing some difficulty. Um, we've gone on from that initial paper, and um, at, at last count we had 24 participants who we'd completed structured interviews with, um, who, had been, who had experienced a parental bereavement between six and 24 months prior to data collection. We're using 24 months as the cutoff because that's the, the period that's been recommended across some of the literature. Um, as you can see, the, the almost half-half male and female, and not surprisingly given that we're, we, we are um, looking to engage with people who can engage with us in the interview process, so in terms of their ability to understand and to communicate with support from the, uh, the prompts that we have. But as you can see, we've got a, a fairly even split between individuals with a mild ID and moderate ID. But we have um, we have used the tool with individual with an individual who has quite severe and profound ID, and as you can see, their mean age there is they're in their forties. So um, this is the the group that we've uh, collected uh, data on so far from across three different intellectual disability service providers.
In terms of what we found, um, now this is the findings from the staff report, so we're collecting staff and service user report. When we look to the staff reporting, we find that um, using the this, this analysis is using the DSM criteria rather than the earlier criteria, which is bereaved uh, less than 12 months, um, greater than 12 months previously. You can see that there's actually only 60% of that group actually meet that criteria. Um, so that's had a, a, had, a, had a shift on our data. In terms of the occurrence of the different symptoms, and we're looking again at significant symptoms in the last month, on criterion B, that separation element, um, just under 30% showed one or more of those separation uh, symptoms. On criterion C, which remember the criteria are weighted towards, none of our participants showed six or more of the 12 criteria. So while we've shown in our staff report that the separation criteria are really important, the DSM focuses on the more traumatic criteria and um, it, it, that's not resonating for um, the people we've talked to. Interestingly though, 30% showed one or more of those more traumatic criteria. Um, and in criterion E, um, which we hadn't defined at that point of the analysis, what we found is that no participant had met all of the criteria excluding criterion E. And we did find that if criterion C, that traumatic difficulty, was reduced to one of 12, then we did have one individual within the staff report who met those criteria. So do you want to say on to that? The general point is the staff report is somewhat minimizes or is the reporting in general is less symptomatic than the direct service user interview. And this is the first time in the literature that actually service users themselves have been interviewed around these symptoms that we could find. Mm. So it's likely that in the limited research that's been done in this area outside the center, um, it's been only carer based or proxy based and based on our limited small sample so far, it would suggest that the care or proxy reporting is minimizing the symptoms. Now, when we actually look at the self-report, we actually see a slightly different picture. So looking particularly at uh, criterion B, again, previous research has shown that from staff report, the separation distress symptoms seem to be key. And when we look at self-report, nearly 90% of the participants have experienced that have experienced one in four of those. So it is something that's being reported at a much higher level from self-report. Including, we found that there's been quite high levels of reporting of hearing your mum or dad's voice, seeing your mum and dad when you're not asleep, which is the way we phrase the question. So things that staff report very, very infrequently when we use self-report, they're um, much more able to, to engage. To the point that I'll just draw your attention to the last point there, if we reduce criterion C's weighting, the self-report would have shown three individuals who met the criteria for um, a, a, a complicated group. So this is really a key thing for us and highlights the need for self-report in this area and supported self-report is that people with ID are in a position to report on their emotional lives, on their emotional experiences and to do it in a way that perhaps is more insightful. Now, there's a health warning that this is a validation study in progress, and we uh, haven't yet shown that, the, stu that the, the scale is valid in terms of it as a tool, but what we have shown is that individuals are perfectly able of reporting these experiences and their supports. And I suppose, you know, you, we could be obsessed with the whole classification and trying to come up with a, you know, a classified diagnosis. That's not the point of all of this. What we're trying to demonstrate is that there's more than just challenging behavior after a, a bereavement. There's a meaning to this. It could be a diagnostic meaning, it could be a life event meaning, but we can sometimes minimize the experience for people with disabilities after an index loss, and it's just minimize them to just basic behavior. Um, and I think that's that's what we're trying to do. Interestingly, the I suppose from the classification point of view, um, within a disability setting, we have adapted from ICD-10 uh, and we've developed uh, through the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK the, the D DCLD, Diagnostic, Diagnostic Classification in Intellectual Disability, and it's used broadly in the British Isles um, in, in mental health services for people with intellectual disabilities. And there is a new edition of it um, being developed uh, following ICD 11 publication, mm -hmm. which we've been invited to contribute to, um, to next year.
So I suppose just to, to, to wrap up on the, the work that we've done around complicated grief and intellectual disability, um, I, I suppose we're really struck by the fact that the, the consensus criteria and the DSM-5 criteria place much more weighting on the traumatic grief criteria than the separation stress criteria. And we are concerned about how much that reflects the experiences of people with intellectual disability. Um, and, and we have highlighted the ability of the separation distress criteria to distinguish between people who are recently bereaved and those who are not. Um, and, and, and this is, I suppose, supported by the role of attachment as a theoretical framework to understand uh, this experience. And our concern would be that if there's an overwhelming focus on traumatic grief criteria, that people with ID um, who, who need some additional support with this uh, process recognizing that their life could be changing hugely when a parent dies and that they could need to move where they live that that could mean that people are not getting supports that they they require um, so that's the, the work that we've done around ID and um, we have in recent times begun to uh, stretch ourselves mainly through working with Anne Dodd and uh, no relation and um, who is our Therese Brady scholar uh, from the Irish uh, Hospice Foundation so Anne was awarded the scholarship last year uh, uh, to work uh, on, on a, a project um, on complicated grief, really driven by the Irish Hospice Foundation's uh, interest and focus on professionals' needs. So looking to complicated grief within the, the typical population to look at what are the needs of professionals in this area. So Anne is looking at um, exploring, assessing and bridging the research practice gap in mental health professionals, knowledge, attitudes and practices with regard to complicated grief. So uh, we're working together with Anne and with Susan Delaney from the Irish Hospice Foundation to complete, um, well to support Anne, to complete a, quite a significant piece of work in an Irish context. Um, Anne's study is going to look at, um, is very broadly situated in the whole idea of evidence-based practice and knowledge transfer, um, which some of you are, are, are working within yourself and using uh, the theory of planned behaviour as a theoretical framework to look at mental health professionals. And we've included GPs in here because it's a particular priority for the Irish Hospice Foundation, but looking at psychiatry, psychology, and then psychotherapy slash counselling professionals and GPs as groups who will be engaging with people who may be experiencing a more complicated bereavement or complicated grief, and to look at their capacity, their ability, their... Um, their attitudes towards engaging with this group. Um, Anne's thesis is, is, is well underway and she's in the final an analysis stages of a systematic review of existing research in this area. Um, she's halfway into a qualitative study of professionals' views and then the aim is to conduct a quantitative survey of attitudes and then an, an action research piece to develop training materials to see how training can be used to bridge any knowledge to practice gap that is there, if it's there. But we're confident that it is there. Um, and just as a snapshot to give you an idea of research that we found, looking at the systematic review with the question of um, uh, what, are the what are the factors that influence how these professionals deliver care to those suffering from complicated grief, and using the framework of knowledge, attitudes, skills, and the fourth one, which escapes my training. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, Anne has, has, has completed a search process which identified only 20 papers that actually looked at these very broad groups of professionals um, and looked at their, their knowledge, attitudes, etc. Um, so despite an initial 300 um, odd articles that appeared to tap into the area, we've only really found two, 20 papers that have looked at this issue consistently. And um, even within those 20 papers, some of them are looking with a very light touch at some of these issues. So needless to say, the extraction of data from some papers has taken five seconds because it's very little, whereas others are more developed. So we're hoping that this will give us a good picture of what is known about this area and the factors that influence professionals. And we see this as being very connected to the ID work because these are the professionals who will be meeting people with intellectual disabilities who may have experienced a difficult bereavement and may be um, experiencing something beyond the, the typical grief reaction. Do you want to say anything about that? Okay. Um, so just to finish, I suppose we, we, we've, we've given you a whistle-stop tour of our ID research um, and we are more than happy to um, 
bore you all over coffee um, about that research and um, um, of which I'm sure you will be fascinated. But what's interesting is, is in preparing for today, we've actually reflected on the fact that a number of strands of our, our research, both together and, and separately, are bringing together the idea of complicated bereavements, not necessarily complicated grief as a concept, but um, uh, we were both involved in a, a major study that's looking at the experience of people with ID um, as they die and their experience of palliative care with Mary McCarran in Trinity and Karen Ryan um, from St. Francis Hospice. We have just um, had accepted for publication a systematic review on suicidality and intellectual disability in the Harvard Review of Psychiatry, um, which was a very interesting piece of work uh, to do with Alva Doherty, who was a, was an intern with us and didn't escape, because she's uh, been with us now for two years, okay. and is coming back, so it's a good sign. But that paper was really born out of our interest in the nature of, of I, I suppose, death, dying and bereavement within an intellectual disability context and finding 24 papers that touched on this area which actually left us with more questions than answers. Um, we, uh, I've been involved in looking at uh, bereavement support in chronic childhood illness for the last number of years through um, work by Peter Hanlon uh, on his PhD and uh, we've also just finished a small, uh, small phase of research um, with Peter and Nicola Mitchell, who's a, a HDIP student, who looked at the bereavement experiences of parents who have no surviving children. So recognising the potential impact of identity um, or loss of identity on those parents. And then linking in more generally to from there into palliative care and bereavement research, we're both uh, connected through the ID study and, and otherwise to the All Ireland Institute for Hospice and Palliative Care. Um, which um, funds uh, Lucia and Prohovtavas uh, post-op, which unfortunately is coming to an end. Um, so it, it really did strike us that we're, we're sort of looking at a number of areas of complicated bereavement and that complicated grief sits within those. So it's, it's, it is a, a, an interesting area with many connections. But just as to conclude, um, I suppose there is a growing awareness in, 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 in the public sphere, but also in research of the impact of more complicated bereavements on the general population. And I think our research in the ID area has highlighted the need to consider other populations, to not just assume that there's a transfer. And um, as Philip touched on, we would be aware that people with ID are at risk of more complicated bereavements because their mum or dad passing away could mean they move home and everything that's been around them for their lives is no longer around them. Um, but we're also interested in other groups um, that whose needs may be highlighted by this, um, particularly people with enduring mental health difficulties and the added implications that a, a significant bereavement can have for that group. And I, I suppose something that we've been aware of as we've gone along is that the literature um, in both general and specialist populations around these more complicated bereavements and complicated groups specifically highlights a lack of clarity among professionals and a need for training in CPD and Anne's experience has been in inviting professionals to be interviewed that people are very keen and come along to contribute to the interview but the first thing they tell you is that they don't know an awful lot about complicated grief which for a researcher doing an interview on complicated grief becomes very challenging but I think it highlights that gap. Phil, is there anything you want to say about yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Well that's us, thank you very much. Um, I would have said this was never 45 minutes long. Um, oh, it is just. It was a very interesting talk on complicated grief. I think we have uh, time for a few questions, if anyone has any. I don't have a question, but more a, a comment. It was fascinating research. I have to say, commend the two of you, absolutely amazing. I have no idea this at all, and I've worked for 20 years in ID. But it, I don't know whether you picked today purposefully or not, but did you know that in the uh, Irish Times health supplement today, there's a whole piece on uh, the Asian cohort of people with intellectual disabilities and talking about dementia, but clearly this is unbelievably timely. But what, what is shocking is the disparity between individuals and the staff that support them. It, it, it is so sad in one way, um, because the, to say people are at risk is, I mean, clearly, it, it, you know, for, for a, an individual with ID, 
their world very often revolves around their parents. Mm -hmm. Their friends are their parents' friends. Their social network is their parents' social network. And more and more, we know of people who the last remaining parent mm -hmm. passes away. And I think you said it yourself, though, and we react to that. We don't plan in advance. Mm -hmm. So the more that this gets out, it just really shows the need mm -hmm. that some of this might be avoided. I think that's very simplistic. But that planning piece and giving a voice to people with symptoms that other people just don't see is, mm -hmm. is commendable. So I'm thrilled. Well, done. well it's interesting what, what sort of got us going more recently in doing the service user, the, the direct uh, self-report is um, we, we put in two HRB grant proposals to do a prospective grief and bereavement study where we would actually follow an individual both from a social experience perspective and a loss perspective from pre-bereavement, post-bereavement, and follow them up over at least a 12-month period. Because I know clinically and anecdotally, it's associated with many, many losses. And I see, through my clinical practice, physical health deteriorating post-bereavement, mental health obviously deteriorating, uh, restrictive uh, environments growing, um, and a loss of a key advocate for the individual. So I know, but I can't prove, um, that the lived experience of a parental bereavement for somebody with an intellectual disability is actually much worse than the general population. And yet to gather credibility around the HRB funded application, um, we have to do this work, I would guess, mm. to try and, because the feedback was, you have no direct service user evidence that this is actually um, that there's any sense of validity for this patient group as, as, mm -hmm. was, as the feedback was given. So our whole, really our, 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 our plan is to try and do a prospective study to mm -hmm. try and document this better so that we can make more meaningful advocate for more proactive responses mm -hmm. um, around aid. Like in our own service, we have uh, the largest waiting list, old-fashioned mm -hmm. term waiting list, for people requiring enhanced residential support. In our service, there's 140 adults with intellectual disability living at home with parents who are over the age of 75. So that means the parent 75, the service user between 50, 40, 50, and I think it was 67 people living at home with a parent who's over the age of 80, where the primary residential support is with a parent who's 80. And that's only one surviving parent in 36 of those cases. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're talking about a very vulnerable part of the population mm -hmm. um, to which we're, we react rather than have any sense of proactivity around support. And I think an added layer of, of, of that situation, um, and one that Laura Douglas is looking at for her MLIT, is the fact that you have this bereavement experience for an individual but they're within a family group who are bereaved themselves. So even where there are two parents and one dies, the surviving parent has experienced bereavement, the siblings have experienced a bereavement. And, and how do you, I suppose, recognise the needs of the family as a unit around that bereavement and the potential risks for a more complicated situation when, when, when there is an individual with ID? So Laura's really interested in the family unit themselves and their experience of that, that process. With the other, it's only the other side point. Our slow pace of gathering cases is, is not really lack of willingness on our side. There is a disenfranchisement um, among a lot of clinical staff and frontline staff that people with disability, you know, they, they probably don't experience grief and bereavement, and therefore, should they be involved in this research that potentially could unsettle them or could create problems? And you know, you have to work with that type of resistance. But it is, it's an ongoing challenge to gather a uh, sample. Um, it's not that difficult to gather a sample of uh, proxy reporters. It's much more difficult to gather a sample of people with disability. Yet we, in the follow-up, um, we've revealed no evidence of any negative responses to the individual taking part. In fact, I have a number of service users who've wanted to take away the complicated grief inventory because they found the visual representations of their feelings really helpful. And in fact, we've used it clinically afterwards yeah. as a way of improving emotional literacy. So there's nothing from, a, from my own experience around people accessing this, this research that in fact it's been negative, but that wouldn't necessarily be, be uh, fed out by some of the people who are identifying potential cases.